Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Illinois Green Party series with your hosts, David Rich and Calvin Tomasco. Calvin, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, and uh, we're talking some labor today. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, we probably got to labor. We got we got climate change in, we got labor in. It's a little bit later than we had expected, but we got them in. Um, yes, we have a special guest tonight, uh, president of the Illinois Labor uh, His Labor History Society, pardon me, uh, Larry Spivak. Larry, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. This is going to be great. Uh, Kevin and I are both very passionate about the labor movement, about labor, labor rights. Uh, co-ops and unions come up a lot. I think every show co-ops come up, um, even if we're talking about, you know, extraterrestrials. He wants to know if there are co-ops out there, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. no, which is great. I mean, it's just great because co-ops are a very interesting thing. Uh, but we want to talk about the, the, the society today, the, the Illinois labor history. Um, is it a, is this specifically the, the society dedicated towards the, the labor movement and the history of it in Illinois only, or is that just the name of it? Well, I, Illinois is the uh, dominant idea yeah. behind who we are, obviously, right. the name. And uh, But you can't talk about labor in Illinois with talking about the rest of the world. After right. all, okay. the Illinois Labor History Society is the proud... Uh, owner of the Haymarket Martyrs Monument, which means that we represent all workers of the world. If anybody knows what that is, like, um, you know, International Labor Day May Day is because of the martyrs of Haymarket. And as the uh, owner of the monument, we therefore have a relationship to what goes on and talk about it, when labor history, the events, if you're talking about Mother Jones, you're talking about organizing coal miners and any child labor all across America. So it's uh, um, uh, it's hard to uh, segregate or sequester uh, and just say that's it. But our entire focus is Illinois labor history. And there's Always, plenty of it here in Illinois, for sure. Uh, yes, uh, it would be fair to say that Illinois is certainly uh, at the uh, top of the list of states in the country where labor history is uh, a, a dominant factor and perhaps uh it could be argued i think reasonably that illinois has led the nation in events that are at the top of when we talk about labor history in terms of the number of events and it's uh interesting because uh, there are more local union ones in illinois than anywhere else in the country Oh, I didn't know that. All right, that's cool. Well, I mean, yeah, speaking of the history of the labor movement in Illinois, I mean, we do have the Haymarket Affair, which is being symbolized by your painting over your right shoulder here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, did you want to start there? Why don't you tell us about the Haymarket Affair? What happened there? Well, uh, you know, if you lived in other countries, you would know that. And I'm, I know you know that, but uh, oh, I know. it's I know. actually yeah. it's quite uh, <laughs> fascinating. I've been involved in this for, you know, a couple of decades, you know, since I've been in the, involved in the Labor History Society since the 1990s, although my whole life has been around labor and the labor movement from being a child of a father who is was a lifelong union member and uh, to when I became a teacher and became a member of the union to in the early 1980s, um, became an organizer for the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees. So um, I've been uh, engaged in the labor movement my entire adult life. And as you can tell by the image here, it's been a fairly long life now. <laughs> so uh, about, you know, certainly 45 years of my life has been dedicated to the labor movement. Um, but I've already gotten beyond uh, the question, and I think you need to repeat it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just said if you wanted to start with talking about the labor oh, history Haymarket. in Illinois, I'd say Haymarket, or you can start before yeah. that. I know there was stuff that happened. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't help but talk about myself, I guess. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it, it, so the, uh, um, uh, and I think I went there because I was thinking about how many years I would talk to people about, uh, I would start out by saying, when I, whether I give a tour, give a talk to a class, I would ask questions. Do you know, how many of you know, uh, what is the most celebrated holiday, secular holiday in the world, or at least one of the top celebrated holidays? And the only people who ever get that are foreign students. Um, when you're talking to say, college students, I believe um, that. 
99.9% of Americans wouldn't have a clue what uh, May Day is about or what the Haymarket affair is. And I appreciate that you said the Haymarket affair because most people that do know something about it call it the Haymarket riot, which is a misnomer right. and actually right. uh, um, highly incorrect, which we can talk about. But Haymarket, uh, the Haymarket affair is the event that uh, spawned the creation of May Day that's celebrated all around the world is International Labor Day. It's the Workers' Day for everyone except in the United States. Uh, uh, I say everyone, but virtually most most countries, most uh, developed and, third, and, un, and less developed countries celebrate uh, May Day, May 1st. Um, and uh, to Americans that in my generation, which is growing up in the 60s, uh, I, bo I was born in the late 50s and growing up in the 60s was an anathema because it was thought of as the holiday for communism that is the Soviet Union and China. Little did they, we know, myself included, that the events that took place at Haymarket Square on uh, May 4th of 1886 uh, that resulted in um, uh, the uh, hanging of four men, uh, five died, one in prison and four were hanged uh, for the fight for the eight hour day. It essentially was a fight for the eight hour day uh, and became a protest movement uh, during that period of time because workers were being attacked for being on strike. And um, the fight for the eight hour day, fight for free speech, the fight for uh, the right to assemble peaceably, uh, the basic uh, protections of the Constitution were not recognized uh, um, in that period in 1886, but uh, it became recognized because of the tragedy, the horrible events that uh, caused four men to die by the sword of the state, the judicial murder, some of us call it, because of their being leaders in a movement. That was essentially what happened was they were when there was no evidence to suggest that they had done anything uh, bad, the state's attorney who was prosecuting the case said that, uh, well, convict them for their ideas to keep us safe. So um, once again, as our history has been repeated over and over again, that uh, much of the uh, crimes uh, that innocent people are convicted of when it comes to political ventures are of their ideas. So. It was, uh, I, I, I know I didn't go into great detail about it, but uh, <clears throat> Chicago, of course, um, uh, it displays in Randolph is now a monument uh, that took, uh, uh, which was the basis for the creation of the Illinois Labor History Society. In 1969, uh, various labor leaders and the activists got together and said, the story of Haymarket isn't properly told. And um and, and or represented and there's nothing here there was a police statue for the to honor the police who actually attacked the workers but uh that's uh which is another story but there was nothing for the worker to represent uh what happened even though it's a holiday celebrated all over the world and people would come to chicago and look for West Haymarket Square. There's nothing here. There was the monument in Forest Park that I previously mentioned, uh, at the cemetery, uh, Forest Home Cemetery, for which is depicted by the print behind me. And um, uh, that is that iconic statue is something that a fair number of people would recognize. But uh, there was nothing in Haymarket Square, and so in 1969, uh, events. Uh, uh, unfolded to start doing uh, rallies there, and they grew. And in 1971, uh, uh, the f last surviving member of the Pioneer Rate Support Association, who was Lucy Parsons' lawyer, and hopefully you'll ask me about who Lucy Parsons is, and uh, uh, dedicated, the deed, gave the deed, signed over the deed to the Haymarket Martyrs Monument to the new Illinois Labor History Society, and. Uh, have since grown to uh, have uh, international stature and probably the most well-known labor history society in the world, or certainly in the U.S. All right, who's Lucy Parsons? 
<laughs> <laughs> so, so when I, I, you know, I, I set you up for that because uh, <laughs> one, one, one of the things that I like to do when I talk about history, labor history in particular, is not just labor history, but people's history. Um, uh, often is how come nobody knows about this? Can it really be that important if nobody knows about it? Well, if I said to most people, Lucy Parsons may be one of the most important people in American history and in world history, mm -hmm. they'd look at me and, you know, uh, uh, in this day and age, unfortunately, uh, for good reason and for bad reasons, we think of things like fake news or we think about conspiracy theories or we think about, uh, but I've been saying this for long before Facebook, as many others have, which is the people's history of the United States. By the way, the book by Howard Zinn is a good one, uh, is a story of the people who helped build America for, in the terms of the struggle for workers' rights, women's rights, minority rights, civil rights. Uh, and those people aren't known. And um, Lucy Parsons was a uh, African-American woman, um, probably had Mexican blood. She was born a slave and married an, uh, uh, an ex-Confederate soldier in, when she met him in Texas in the 1870s. And they were both political activists and writers and organizers and um, eventually moved to Chicago. Um, and uh, she, even though uh, it would be called the widow of Albert Parsons, one of the Haymarket martyrs who was hanged by the state uh, for his ideas, um, she carried on, but she was an activist in her own right. She was at the founding convention of the IWW of 1905, which is a whole nother historical series of events and a, a great uh, American story that few people know about, but these are the stories that aren't told in the traditional books. Lucy Parsons would hardly be known to anybody. Um, and, uh, yet she, uh, helped build the movement of the fight for the eight hour day, the fight for workers' rights. That was her primary focus. And, um, uh, there is a, now a park named after her in Chicago, but that took decades to get, just like it took for us to get a statue at Haymarket Square uh, after we were formed in 1969. So Lucy Parsons is, uh, uh, I guess you could argue, is a mother <clears throat> mother of the fight for the eight-hour day, the, might, <clears throat> the fight to uh, bring dignity to the workplace and to end ex uh, exploitation of workers uh, uh, in the uh, um, late 19th century and she lived until 1942 when she died in a house fire in Chicago. Oh wow. And she's buried next to the monument that again is depicted by the uh, print uh, over my it is my right shoulder isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> Okay, very cool. Thank you. That's uh that's uh very interesting stuff. Uh did they have children? Did she have children? They had two children, Albert uh Jr. and Lulu. Uh, Lulu was the girl. And in fact, Albert and Lulu were at the rally of uh, the Haymarket rally. Um, it figures into the story when we when I we tell the story of what happened on that fateful night of uh, to, uh, Tuesday, May 4th, 1886, uh, when there was the rally to protest the police brutality against the street workers from a creeper plant. Um, who were shot and killed the night before. Um, Albert uh, and Lucy didn't even know there was going to be a rally, uh, to, and, but they were well known and he had just come back from Cincinnati and they uh, had met up Al, uh, uh, Albert Parsons and his wife, Lucy, and she, they had two kids in tow and somebody came up to them and said, there's a rally to protest the killing of workers. Can you come be a speaker at it? So they grabbed their kids and uh, the kids were with them at the rally. And the reason I mention this is that um, uh, when uh, people think about, oh, well, these uh, eight men that were picked out and tried for conspiracy to commit violence and murder, to kill the police and uh, destroy the way of life as we know it in America at that time, um, uh, you have to ask what person would bring their two little kids to a rally 
and uh, be next to them where a bomb was going to be thrown that they knew about. It doesn't oh, even it was, make sense. No, it's it's, it's completely a, what, a kangaroo court. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, they needed so a scapegoat, it, and that was it. Yeah. Right, exactly. And that's, of course, was the pretext to end the labor movement. But uh, right. Albert uh, and, Lou, and his wife and two kids <laughs> were at the Union Hall after he gave his first, he was the first speaker of that night. And uh, when the bomb went off, uh, you know, the kids were, in, were with him. The two children are buried uh, in urn, are, their remains are in urns uh, um, in the uh, in Lucy's grave site, which is right next to the big martyr's monument. Oh, that's very so, cool. That's yeah, like that. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Any relation to the Alan Parsons Project, the band from the 70s? Uh, not that I know of, uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, I know. But, <laughs> All right. Well, there is, a, there is there is a distant relative so this is kind of interesting because uh there are a, a handful of relatives who uh uh descendants um and when our vice president died uh, uh well, the founder the vice president and there were our president vice president uh the president being less O'Rear, who helped organize the packing house workers union in the 1930s and 40s um uh he was the uh known he was the longtime president till uh uh i became president in 2006 uh from its inception in 1971 actually um although we were founded in 69 um bill edelman well-known professor of uh labor education labor history who really did most of the tours uh that i learned uh from him uh he died in, I think it was around 2009, and we had a great grandnephew of Albert Parsons who lived in the North Shore come and talk to us, uh, to a small group of people. So uh, there is uh, at least one descendant of the Parsons family that we know about. Um, and uh, there are other descendants from some of the other martyrs, but... Uh, Sure. Oh, that would be interesting to get a hold but, of them the, but, but the story, the, the refrain of the descendants is that most of them didn't know anything about their past because the story was suppressed in the families. After oh, they didn't family. even know. No. Yeah. I, oh, that's really interesting. Be, okay. The best the best story about that, one of the martyrs, uh, uh, he was pardoned, uh, Oscar Nibi. Um, uh, he uh, um, and he, his remains are at the market. He was the only one who did not get uh, the death penalty. He got 15 years in Joliet for buying, uh, contributing two dollars that bought the printing press that printed the flyer that announced uh, the event. Um, wow. That's a that's a whole another story. But his grandson, um, Bill Neby, William Neby, um, who became a union printer, a graphic designer and ended up being a member of the Illinois Labor History Society for many years. Um, when he was a young man, I believe he was in his early 20s, he was an artist and he went to Mexico and he was treated like a hero and he didn't know why. But it turns out, of course, that in Mexico, uh, there is a statue of the Haymarket Martyrs. They're well known. And he okay. was the grandson. He said, uh, Bill Neby, William Neby told us, he goes, I was 20 years old. I had no idea that my grandfather was Oscar Neby, the uh, guy who was, he didn't know about the Haymarket Affair until he went to Mexico. That's amazing. So it tells you, yeah. It's quite the indictment of the uh, American education system, for sure. Correct. Uh, I, should, I should say indoctrination system, not, not education. But okay. Uh, I have 8,000 billion questions uh, and comments because I, I love this stuff and I've spent a lot of time looking into this stuff. So I'll, before I take up the entire show calvin go ahead oh yeah no worries, no worries. i i want to for the audience um complete the arc of of haymarket if we can real quick because you, you say illinois is the center of of a lot of labor um actions in history a lot of major pivotal ones at that so uh you've mentioned to me and we've hung out before and you showed me a couple of these monuments and it was uh, amazing to be in their presence. I highly suggest any um, Illinois folk to make it out to these monuments and, and get some tours if you can. Um, so I want to go over the Pullman strikes. I want to talk about Stockyard. Um, 
stockyard uh, labor movements there. Um, but before we do, I really want to hammer home for folks that Haymarket is an event felt around the world. Yeah. Uh, they have statues of them, as you just mentioned, of the uh, of the eight martyrs. And uh, this was an, a, eventually voted to be recognized as an international holiday. It wasn't just each individual country made a choice to uh, spontaneously right. have it as a day. It was recognized in an international um, event, right? Um, could you talk about, so this started with workers dying. It was... Uh, a large protest that turned into violence and then a kangaroo court and then the international. Can you go through that, you know, as quick as you can? So, um, the, yeah, the, uh, event of the Haymarket tragedy of that uh, day of May, 1886 was because there had been a call in 1884 by the or organization that ultimately became the American Federation of Labor uh, for every year to be on strike by May 1st of 1886 for the eight-hour day. There had been eight-hour day movements. There had been eight-hour day legislation. And this completely revolutionary idea that you would somehow be paid uh, the same amount of wage for working eight hours instead of 14 or 15 or whatever people normally worked was... Uh, uh, it was a stake in the heart to the idea of corporations at that time, the gilded class. It was the gilded age. And um, uh, so there was huge resistance to it. But by May, for, by April, in fact, I often tell the story because there's good documentation of this. Uh, you can see it at the uh, um, Chicago Historical Society, uh, the map that shows the uh, 350,000 workers across the country were on strike uh, at this point in 1886, in the spring of 1886, and 80,000 of them were in Chicago on strike because Chicago was the new uh, industrial center of America at this point. And um, uh, by April of 25th of 1886, 10,000 workers had already won the eight-hour day from strikes. And this, there's this map at the Chicago Historical Society that shows all the different marches and routes of all the different unions and workers of different crafts and guilds striking and protesting. And um, on May 1st of 1886, 80,000 people marched up Michigan Avenue led by Albert and Lucy Parsons. Uh, a peaceful wow. march and a fight and um uh the uh um uh uh result was that uh it was peaceful and albert went to cincinnati and to organize workers there and came back on may 4th but uh on may 3rd uh the uh um po the police had showed up at the mccormick reaper plant mccormick is the uh factory that built the farm implements and it was owned by the mccormick family colonel mccormick who also owns the tribune and still i mean it's it hasn't changed let's just put it that way uh you know when you're talking about the pullmans the fields the mccormicks uh the armors the swifts it goes on and on they owned america the vanderbilts and so on the carnegies and um yep. the one for the, they were the billionaires of the day and um, the Jeff Bezos of the day. And um, uh, there was a lockout at the McCormick Reaper plant and police showed up as often. Hey, Larry, I think we're losing you just a little bit. So uh, you were just mentioning police, if you're coming back. You're frozen right now, if you can hear us. Yep. Darn technology. It's, it's been raining quite a few it's days right now. It's been storming for the last two days. Yeah, it was really windy and everything. That might have something to do with it. I don't know. That, that might. That might. Maybe maybe some water washed up, moved a pole or something. So hopefully Larry comes back in a moment. Um, but yeah, uh, David, what are your thoughts on like how this day is of importance to the entire world? Um, <laughs> and how it. America shifted over to the beginning of September? Yeah, yeah. What are I, your it's, thoughts? It's, it's mer I think it's just, well, generally, I think I'm glad that the world recognized it. Uh, that's amazing. It's very powerful. Um, but, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, it's just more elitist, uh, American elitist exceptionalism. All right. Hi. Hey, buddy. 
I, I'm back. so sorry. So, suddenly <laughs> it just went black. I have no idea what happened. I don't these know. these things happen. No worry. Uh, we'll just okay. roll with it. <laughs> All right. Well, where I left off was talking about the uh, the attack on uh, uh, workers, uh, and and I'll, I'll try to cut to the chase. Two workers were shot and killed. The uh, people got together and said we should have a protest. This is it. We're tired of being attacked and killed every time we're on strike, every time we're fighting for our rights. And so uh, uh, workers got together and called for a protest at the uh, Haymarket Square at Des Plaines and the intersection near Des Plaines and Randolph. And um, uh, that night, the next night, they got together. Uh, um, and uh, only about 2,500 people showed up. Uh, they had hoped 20,000, but it was a horrible day, terrible weather, not enough time. Uh, and um, uh, the police showed up. Uh, the mayor uh, said all was peaceful. You should go home. The police didn't go home when the mayor went home because it was peaceful. And then the police moved in and told the workers to disperse. And somebody threw a bomb that nobody knows that ended up at the foot of the police, killed one policeman. Police opened fire, uh, shot six of their own workers, so seven police died. They shot them because of friendly fire. There was no, it was panic. I mean, there was no lights and a bomb was thrown and nobody threw bombs in those days. So it was uh, the first time that we know of that a bomb was thrown in peacetime. And uh, they had, that having happened, uh, there was a quick, uh, uh, um, suddenly the state, uh, you know, the state's attorney on behalf of the corporations uh, tried, found, indicted eight people, uh, eight men who were activists, labor leaders, people who were at least were in the movement of workers' rights, uh, anarchists, socialists, uh, uh, labor leaders, uh, uh, anarcho-syndicalists. You can use all the different terms, but they were basically uh, uh, sympathetic to the cause of the working man and women. And um, uh, that uh, spawned this uh, event. Um, and I think uh, we were talking about the arc, and you should kind of remind me what the question was again. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, for the audience to really understand that something happened in Chicago that resonated yeah. throughout the world. Oh, yes, so, yes. And yeah, and yeah. so. After after the event, the kangaroo court, the murder of these men after their appeals um, that who were hanged and ultimately pardoned in 1893. But before that, in 1889, um, at the Second International in France, workers got together from all around the world, including delegates from Chicago, with a resolution to call for May 1st in honor of the Haymarket Martyrs to celebrate Labor Day, International Workers Day. And that became the first Labor Day around the world. And then um, uh, America didn't uh, officially celebrate it, although there were big Labor Day parades up into the 1930s, May Day parades. But um, uh, you had mentioned Pullman, and because of the strike in Pullman in 1893, 1894, um, uh, Grover Cleveland signed legislation that then called for uh, recognition of a, a Labor Day the first Monday in September. Hmm. I didn't know that. That's. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, they had to felt like they had to push it over to September. I think it's just a very yeah, strange and, thing. Like instead of just you know aligning with the rest of the world, but okay. And it wasn't that like there was a national U.S. national holiday on May first, and then they also wanted to add Labor Day as a separate U.S. only thing in September. No, it it was we're not going to recognize May 1st nationally and we're only going to recognize the September Labor Day nationally in right, hopes right. to separate the ideas and the notions. Right, right. You know, it, it, interestingly enough, uh, May Day has gotten calm, more of an event. Um, I mean, we it's always been celebrated by small groups of uh, political activist types, but with the immigrant rights movement that really started growing in 2006, in fact, you know, there was a massive march in Chicago uh, that went right past Hay Haymarket Square. We had collaborated a little bit with the immigrant rights movement, and for a number of years until recently, there were large marches on May 1st in honor of May Day for the immigrant rights movement. So, um, but it's uh, uh, interesting whether or not, uh, for me, it's uh, always been a, a life 
you know, a life goal is to get May Day to be celebrated in a, a broad way in America. Hmm. We should uh, keep in touch and work on that for maybe next May. <laughs> I would, I would love that too. Don't get me wrong. It, it kind well, of... if if for <clears throat> for for our viewers uh, um, who don't know this, if you go to Haymarket Square, where the uh, Haymarket monument is not the one in forest park the classic one behind my right shoulder uh but the uh uh the newer one that was dedicated in 2004 um it has a base and the illinois labor history society you as the sponsor of every may day in chicago at haymarket square along with the chicago federation of labor uh this is also something i'm very proud of is getting uh, organized labor to uh, uh, be a co-sponsor of May Day. This is actually pretty radical if you think about it, and those of you who know organized labor in America. And um, uh, we have a plaque, one or two plaques, dedicated every year to the base of the monument from an international labor organization. So if you go there, you will see plaques from Ireland, from uh, France, from Sweden, from Mexico, from New Zealand, from Japan. Awesome. Uh, there will be one from Canada and Italy. They were last year, but we had the pandemic, so they didn't come. Uh, they're not up yet. Uh, uh, Germany, um, uh, Iraq, um, I, now I'm, of course, Colombia was the first one. So there have been plaques dedicated from international labor organizations, including the AFL-CIO and the Chicago Federation of Labor, to the Haymarket Martyrs Monument every year since 2005. Very cool. All right. Calvin, do you have anything more? Because I got plenty. I wanted to uh, say thank you so much for completing that arc. I think it's really important that we that we see that we have history here in Illinois that we can truly be proud of as part of the working class. Uh, yeah, but then that that wraps it up in a nice bow. Uh, David, take us down Curiosity Lane. Let's go. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and talk more about police and public sector unions because that's pretty much a hot topic nowadays and. Just kind of bring it full circle from the the start of the labor movement and uh, to now, especially in Chicago, what's going on with the the police union? Uh, say they're not going to like get back or mandate vaccinations and Lori Lightfoot that whole thing. Uh, but let's talk about like public unions in general, uh, public sector unions, including especially the police ones, because like with with the, a lot of uh, people are kind of pointing their fingers at the unions, uh, police unions themselves, because of how much protection they give the officers when they do terrible things. Um, <laughs> and what would you say as a unionist yourself about that? Well, let's say, uh, you know, there's no, these are complicated issues and that's not a cop, that's not a cop, cop out, no pun intended, but, um, uh, you know, first, People should know uh, that I believe all workers have the right to a union. I Absolutely. feel strongly about that. Uh, being organized makes sense. I believe police should be unionized. Although, you know, there are different unions, different kinds of unions. Uh, and uh, some are, uh, uh, for instance, most police unions are not affiliated with the traditional organized labor, you know, like the Fraternal Order of Police are uh, in many ways. Um, uh, are there, there, you know, I mean, corporations are unionized, right? They have their own association. What's a union, but an association. So in a way, I guess I'm kind of distancing myself from police unions on one hand, but on the other hand, the union that I've worked for, for many years, uh, represents, uh, law has represented police unions uh, that were in our union. Although I don't think there's any more police, uh, that our members have asked me, certainly not in Illinois. I don't know if there are any um, true. There's all different elements of law enforcement, correctional officers and are in traditional unions, but police unions tend to be by themselves. Uh, there's a few major ones, but um, uh, although some police are represented by the Teamsters uh, in Chicago, the Fraternal oh, Order. Yeah, yeah, uh, th there are, uh, oh, but uh, these are nuances. The uh, uh, issue of law enforcement unionization and uh, what we call the, because you brought up the issue of police being protected. Um, you could say this in any 
particular workplace, that people have the right to due process. That's what the union is about, is the right to due process. So I spent a lifetime with, uh, especially years ago, it's, it's people are actually, uh, again, the public is much more supportive of unions than it was 20, 30 years ago, um, the general public. Uh, oh, for a variety good. of reasons. Yeah, yeah. The, the unions are now at their highest level of support among the general public in surveys in 40 years. Um, uh, so, yeah, the numbers are up over 65 oh. percent. Um, uh, but uh, the question would always come up. Well, the problem with unions is they just protect bad workers. So it's not just that issue would always come up. They just protect bad workers. You can't fire somebody who's in a union. One, it's absolutely untrue, not even close to true. Um, it's like civil service. It just means there is due process. So we have a constitution. There is a reason that people have the right to a speedy trial. There's a reason that people have a right to a, to a defense attorney. It's to protect the constitutional rights of all people to make sure that there isn't tyranny. And this is, of course, in the union or in the workplace, as opposed to the, since there are, workers are not protected by constitutional rights. That's why we have unions, because we don't have rights. This is America where rights do not uh, inure to workers. Um, it, uh, so that's why unions were for, are formed. It uh, just yeah. doesn't exist. And so workers don't have freedom of speech. Workers don't have uh, basic uh, rights to privacy or anything else. But a union contract can be negotiated that gives them some rights. The primary right being due process, that if I am accused of something, I have the right to be defended. Now, um, uh, this is it's simply a myth that somehow uh, uh, bad workers are protected, but due process means that people have to go through a process. And any of us that any of you who know about what happens in workplaces is that management usually is not interested in doing its job. Most problems in workplaces result from management, bad management, poor management practices, uh, it goes on and on and on. And um, good leadership makes a better workplace. Good management makes a better workplace. But um, so workers should have the right to a defense, to protection if they do something that they're accused of, of which there's no shortage of issues that come up. And anybody that's had a problem in a workplace that doesn't have a union and feels they were treated unfairly, it's too bad they don't have a union contract to at least give them a chance to have... Uh, the right to uh, uh, be represented. So that's all that a uh, that's the major part of what a union is. And so that occurs within the public sector, within police unions, they have <clears throat> due, due process. Um, there, I, I can't speak to the, all the specifics, uh, but uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, for the most part, you know, the the system systemic racism in this society uh, that is built into the employment of uh, public employees in, that are in police departments. Uh, management was never interested in doing anything about terrible police, you know, because in fact, that's one area where uh, there was less interest in um, uh, it. it uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that in the public sector in general, management's always trying to terminate people and does successfully for people who are incapable or unable to perform their duties. In law enforcement, in in able, being unable to perform your duties, which means uh, lethal action against innocent uh, citizens, is something that I would say historically police departments haven't had an interest in even worrying about because it wasn't until, you know, the last, especially in the last 10 years, um, because of the political grassroots movement that has grown up around um, this uh, attack on um, African Americans in particular, uh, that's historical. When police, police departments were formed uh, going back into the 19th century, most workers were against it because police departments were formed primarily to 
uh, keep workers from organizing and to attack immigrants. There's that historical irony there, yes. That's the that historical that? irony. <laughs> so, I mean, these are complicated questions and issues, but, um, uh, I, and I'm sort of just going on and on about this because I kind of took a guess at what you're asking me in, with respect to police unions. And, uh, no, I look, I was, so. a police, I, I was a union steward for 11 years out in, uh, at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, and I loved it. I loved everything about it. And I learned a lot about, like, what you're talking about, like management kind of, like, I was eight out of 10 of the problems that happen in a given day in a department is probably because management screwed up somehow. Uh, and they love to pass that buck off onto the employees and get them in trouble mm -hmm. over nothing. Um, absolutely agree that, that everything should be either a co-op and or unionized a hundred percent. I, the, the, the fact that uh, you're right, everybody de deserves due process and unionism is really just about bringing democracy into the workplace and all the rights there are. Exactly. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of the problems with the police that we have nowadays has to do with legislation, qualified immunity, that kind of thing. The people who rep the union uh, representatives who represent the police during a, a trial of whatever um, are simply, you know, going to refer to these laws and regulations and standards that have been put there by other people. Um, but let's also remember, like one thing that uh, Kevin and I discussed not too long ago is that. There's a difference between condoning and advocating for unionism as a concept and as a logistic and a, as a right of people and specific behaviors of specific unions at specific times. Okay, some you know, I know my lady that I work with was getting into like uh, something about graphics in the uh, mid 70s, whatever union it was, wouldn't hire women. Okay, I didn't know that, you know, you think about unionism that well, how, how can a unionist possibly not hire a woman that goes against everything unions stand for, right? Well, they did it. The fact of the matter is that no matter how ideal the concept is, it's still populated by people who can be far less than ideal and not even understand fully what it is to be a unionist. I would, the people that were in my union that I represented, they didn't know anything about the labor movements or what unions are. They just knew that they got to stick it to management on occasion, um, which is fine, sufficient. You know, I, I filled in the rest for them. I was there, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but I just say that I, I mean, you know, and I, so this is a segue into the, the next topic, which is like the sub unions and Calvin, help me out if you remember the, the exact ones that I know there was a picture of, was it Mitchell McConnell and some union guy and it said like if fossil, getting rid of fossil fuels is in the new bill, it's a deal breaker. And I was like, okay, hold on. You know, I mean, I want to support unions, but now we're talking about climate change. We're talking about the environment. We're talking about something that needs to change needs to happen but they're their mere their mere monofocal concern is their jobs which is a legitimate concern i'm not saying it's sure. not but i mean can you speak to that a bit about like you know when unions just aren't really doing you know the right thing well um i'm you know it's uh how difficult is it for any individual to think uh down the road so the issue of climate change, the existential crisis of our time, as uh, some have talked about it, uh, it is difficult when uh, you are a West Virginia coal miner and it's the only good job in the entire state. I, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say good, the only high paying job if it's a union coal mine, because most coal miners are no longer unionized around the country. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it's a good paying job. And no. it's hard to imagine, and it's now you're in your fifth generation of coal mining, and you are um, uh, being told by everybody around you that uh, if you don't have a, if you don't have coal, you will just be poor. You know, it's a failing of uh, every level of our of the institutions that people live, work, and breathe for, uh, or. Uh, I don't know why I thought of breathing when I'm thinking about coal mining, but uh, well, that's um, a big, that's, it's harder to yeah. breathe than the mines. I sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, of course, uh, um, uh, you know, there, because institutionally we don't put forth the alternatives in a way that say if you had say, if you say to coal miners. Um, or you say to people who work in industries that uh, are uh, uh, large uh, producers of carbon, um, that have a big carbon footprint, um, we're going to just lay you off, you're thinking about survival. But if right. you said, hey, listen, we're now going to employ you at the same wage uh, to create solar panels, 
I think most people would say, okay, cool. I'll do that. And I got, I have a pen, you know, I have everything that I had before, but we don't do that. And so this fits right. the corporate, uh, um, uh, mentality, the, 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 the corporate agenda, the corporate agenda is to get workers to be against their own interests, to get people to vote against their own interests. And that's simply what this is. And so, yeah, you're going to have, uh, uh, and, uh, Hey, listen, um, uh, even though, uh, I, uh, one of the things I we're doing at the Illinois Labor History Society is we have an annual benefit every year, an annual fundraiser where we call the Union Hall of Honor. And uh, we have a theme and we have a program and it's a, the biggest thing we do every year. And this year, our theme is unions and uh, labor and labor and civil rights. Now, what's uh, interesting is that our uh, article that we're going to be putting into our newsletter is to discuss the contradictory nature of that exists in our society that has occurred with labor and civil rights over the years we're we want to talk about the fact that um uh at the same time that uh labor activists will fight for civil rights labor unions historically in some places have discriminated and not allowed blacks into their union or women into their union this goes back to the knights of labor and the knights of labor in the 1870s had having an open idea that uh everybody's welcome except that if you went to certain places if you were in the knights of labor you still wouldn't allow blacks or women into the organization which was a union at the time in the 1870s um a national union and so um you know there are restrictive covenants and all kinds of things and uh uh going back in the past so unions are sim i think you actually mentioned this earlier when you talk about the people that make up unions are the are our society and right. so we internally have to fight for change within those institutions. The truth is that unions have been at the forefront of the fight for civil rights and desegregation 100%. and everything else. But at the same time, those problems exist, whether it's in right. a police union or so it, uh, oh. it it's uh, the this is the inherent you know contradiction within all of us in society and in our institutions because we're part of those uh institutionally racist and sexist uh organizations that have existed that grow out of the society dominated by capital absolutely very well said thank you i'm glad you uh that you you, you elaborated very well on that um i had i had a radio show and i had like a libertarian spike cohen who was the last uh, vice presidential candidate for the libertarian party on my show and he and a bunch of other libertarians um concerning what's going on with police and the, the protections thereof that kind of thing they want public unions out they just you know they don't mind private sector unions but get them out and i'm like whoa hold on come on dude well you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. unionism is a great idea like you said it's been at the forefront of civil rights since the its inception since the movement began in the 1800s um the, it's, like everything else in reality it's a work in progress um and we've come a long way in a lot of ways for sure um so yeah so thank you for all that you said there spot on. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I really liked how you oh. highlighted that because in our constitution in America uh, or in the U.S., we don't have these rights inherent. Uh, I am. I, I quickly thought of like, there. Are, oh yeah, there are other countries that have guaranteed paid sick leave. They just understand that we're human beings and that it should be legislated so that um, your employer needs to recognize you as a human being who sometimes gets ill and you have paid sick leave. Like, uh, you still need money that week. You still need a roof over your head and food. Uh, so, of course, paid sick leave. Like, it makes so much sense. But um, what we have to do is form unions um, and collectively bargain for paid sick leave and for maternity leave and uh, paternity leave. Like, these are things that are other countries have enshrined into their legislation and into their constitution, uh, but we have not yet. So thank goodness for unions. And uh, I also like the idea of, yes, uh, maybe a coal union is found to, in our day and age, still be behind coal and the furthering of coal and uh, continued use of it or opening up a new uh, coal mine. Sure, sure, that might happen, but we're still in a better place overall 
with unions. We still have the eight hour workday where had we not had unions, we wouldn't have that. And if coal miners were all still working 14, 16 hour days and still having children dying in small parts of their minds, uh, we, we, wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't expect them to be uh, any more conscious about the environment than, than they are now. I'm sure there are many coal miners conscious about the environment. And that's all thanks to unions. So we can't just look at one example of unions wow. where they don't seem to fit our perfect societal description and uh, and say, oh, that means unions are bad. I perfectly right. uh, pointed out there, David. Um, I, you know, one of the interesting yeah, things, because you make me think about when we talk about you don't have constitutional protections for workers. Um, it reminds me how um, the uh, it, which means you don't have democracy in a workplace. You can't really you, you go. You look at this totalitarian regimes and they're against having unions. The reason they're against having unions is that unions breed democracy. The whole notion of a union, and even though there's a myth that you know unions are monolithic run by one guy and that sort of thing, um, you know, mo most union leaders, all union leaders are elected. Um, people who get involved in unions end up going to meetings where they have to debate and they have to be involved in the civic duty of that particular organization. People learn democracy from being in unions. And um, it's interesting that if you look at or uh, whether it's Central America, or Nazi Germany or other totalitarian fascist regimes, the first thing they do is outlaw unions. They end unionization. Why is that? Because unions stand in the way of democracy, stand in the way, I'm sorry, stand in the way of totalitarianism because the fundamental nature of a union is that <clears throat> democratic control over the workplace. Right. And that's where we spend most of our time. And so uh, it's while most of the people that would never think about this, this is this, the smart people that are fascists understand it. And so that's why um, union rights are always um, uh, ended when uh, there is a drive towards fascism. And uh, so if so. you and if you look at why is it that, uh, you know, um, uh, the most regressive uh, places in the world don't have unions, which includes the United States. If you look at the, the 25 to 30 states that have what they call right to work for less laws, um, mm -hmm. don't allow you, you know, true unionization because uh, it's about uh, how do you keep the ability to how do you allow for the ability of corporations and capital to control people's lives? Um, it's to me, it's all always been ironic that uh, the people who understand the right to unionization are the rich and powerful and famous. And so if you talk about the people who are the most talented, the people who are the wealthiest, the people who you would think don't need a union are the ones that fight for having a union, which include um, uh, uh, screen actors, athletes, who are more talented than the athletes. That's the cream of the cream. And they all have a union and... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so it's it somehow uh it's thought about that unions are bad for workers but what it means is it gives them an opportunity to have a voice and that's what people want that's what rich people want that's what the most talented people want so they not only have agents but they have unions so why not for the rest of the working class no absolutely i agree 100 uh real quick there's uh nick thompson has a question for the guest since the Reagan era, unions and labor—I don't have my glasses. U era, unions and labor organizing has been difficult. What are some immediate policy slash legislation or tactics should organizers organizers wanting to empower labor be working towards? Well, this is uh, uh, the very the most fundamental one is the Pro Act that, of course, uh, has been sponsored by uh, the Democratic some in the Democratic Party, but uh, uh, to me, it still seems unlikely that uh, uh, given that, you know, a good portion of the Democratic Party is still the Republican Party, that uh, it's hard yep. going to be hard. The PRO Act would be the closest thing to uh, the National Labor Relations Act that was passed in 1935. In other words, labor law reform. America has the worst labor laws in the world, in the developed world. We have the most regressive. Uh, they're backwards. They, we really don't have the right to strike. I know that sounds weird to people, but for all intents and purposes, we don't because of Reagan's actions, which is what our uh, 
question uh, Esker was really referring to the Reagan era because of the firing of the air traffic controllers. And since that time, most workers can't go on strike. It's a longer discussion, but that has to do with the, the law. And, uh, um, and so the other thing is that you pretty much the reason people are always asking, well, how come uh, if people, uh, the unions are good, how come people in the auto industry in the South aren't, uh, why do they keep voting against their union? How come at Amazon they voted against uh, having a union? Well, it's because the law basically gives all the power to corporations to run an anti-union campaign and threaten, intimidate, and fire workers. 10,000 workers a year are fired for trying to organize a union because it's legal to fire you, even though it's illegal. There's no enforcement of it. So this is what the PRO Act would do. The question is, why isn't every Democrat on board for the PRO Act? Um, and, uh, you know, then you end up with people like Joe Manchin and Cinema and a few others who will... Uh, say, well, you know, uh, ultimately they're Republicans, so they're not going to be for it. But um, uh, the PRO Act, I can't remember what it stands for now, I apologize, but that is the leg current legislation uh, that under Obama was called the Employee Free Choice Act, but it never went anywhere. And it was a failure of the administration at that time. And to me, the greatest failure of this administration will be if it doesn't pass the PRO Act. So um, it's on the table, but uh, whether it gets, you know, uh, you, you know, given our one one party system, it's pretty hard to uh, pass progressive legislation. Yeah. And, and then still going on that question, um, you know, from a historical context, back before they had the Internet going, um, maybe not even ready use of telephones, uh, you know, you used to have to walk to the nearest payphone. What's something that we could be doing to organize to reinvigorate labor and and bring back the strength of labor um and just on the organizing level well i think legislatively the pro act is is the uh the the uh would be the best possible way to do it but the i uh but uh, it, you know the, the, it's a very complex question that you just asked uh, because <laughs> you know we don't have a tradition uh, uh, uh you know since the new deal of and even then i mean america is a, a is a nation that's uh, uh developed not around uh you know a collective sort of uh, mutual support and aid society but uh, uh we are taught through the corporate agenda that we must pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and so it's a foreign concept to americans and look uh you know to uh, suddenly you know republicans as an example and some democrats are worried about the word socialism you know anything the socialist agenda i mean the biden administration's as far from a socialist agenda as you can imagine but yeah. they use the word even though younger people don't care about it because it doesn't mean anything anymore um, in fact, it means a good thing, you know, so Medicare and Social Security and uh, uh, um, uh, general rights that uh, people have once we're considered socialist. We don't consider them socialist, but yet uh, 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 the idea that uh, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that, um, again, institutionally, collectively, we're so far removed from the idea of mutual aid and support that is the history of how we make change. Uh, at the grassroots level, and um, even unions often who are struggling to just survive uh, in the private sector, uh, pr particularly, um, uh, even though now strike the idea of striking is coming back in a big way. Yep. Um, the average worker uh, doesn't really understand the concept of collective action. Collective action is the very fundamental basis for how you change anything. If anybody, I've now watched like three or four uh, um, the, uh, 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 um, episodes of the Squid Game, uh, which is on. Uh, so <laughs> what I, is I, that? What, the thing's everywhere. I don't even know what it is. It's correct. It's it's we it's talk a, about it after the show. I just. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but the point is that there's this developing idea that we have to, if we're going to be strong, we have to work together as a team as opposed to uh, as individuals. Yeah. 
So, oh, um, and I mentioned that just because people, you know, it's in the popular culture and I, I don't know where it's going. I haven't watched all the episodes yet, <laughs> but, um, uh, the idea of, uh, working collectively is usually, uh, stomped out by the powers that be, because that's how change takes place. That's how it always takes place. Historically, that's always been the case, you know? And so, but we want to tell history as if it's always been by individual great people who change everything no they may have great ideas but it's uh collective yeah so uh, individuals might kick it off but that's about it yeah you know marx wrote you know with angles wrote the communist manifesto and then poof you know but yeah you're right i mean you know eventually it's all it's always a collective yeah. nobody lives in a vacuum uh it is but eight o'clock oh sorry my goodness. go ahead no no, no go ahead finish your thought that was oh, fast no, another one it, it's just a tough, <laughs> tough question because you're saying, well, how do you do it? Well, it's always the on. So what I would say is know your history. And if you know your history, and this is why history is not told, because if people knew their history, in fact, when I do workshops, when I talk to workers, new stewards, activists, and I start telling them the history, they become excited, want to be involved in their union. When people are involved in their union, you see, when people aren't involved in their union, then the union doesn't do anything. What can it do? But when people are involved in their union and the history, so what I would say is the best thing you can do is teach people history as it truly was, which was people organizing. That's what history was. Yeah. One hundred percent, Calvin. Any uh, last uh, comments? I think uh, I think you heard them clearly, folks. Go join your, uh, you know, get involved if you're union. If you're already part of a union, sign up to work at a union shop. Um, form a union if you can. Make sure you reach out to a local union uh, to get advice on how to form a union, and then join any labor group that you know of. Uh, Green Party, definitely come join us. Uh, and any other labor organization that that you see fit. Um, that's where it's at. Oh, collective action. And, I love it. And go to IllinoisLaborHistory.org. IllinoisLaborHistory.org. If there is a Green Party person that doesn't know what this is about, then you are failing yourself. So go <laughs> ahead. Absolutely. All right. Well, Larry Spivak, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's fascinating. In fact, I think we're going to have to get you on again because I, I we didn't, we haven't even talked about Marxism and unionism. We haven't talked about like <laughs> the different types of socialism, uh, which is very important. Libertarian, uh, uh, libertarian socialism, anarcho syndicalism, the anarchists, and the uh, there's a there's so much to talk about with this stuff. Absolutely. So uh, and I want to I want I want to be able to tell you about the Pullman National Monument now. So there, yeah, exactly. There's there's yeah. there's a there's a ton more. So I think we're going to have to just get you scheduled like literally right after the show. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in again for another episode of the Illinois Green Party series. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. And yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, collectivize. You know, you, you, nobody lives in a vacuum. We're all doing this together. And now it might be even an ample time because of this whole labor shortage, which is a misnomer. Um, but, yeah. like, you know, uh, em employers are now a little bit frightened. You know, <laughs> so you, have their, you have them in a vulnerable state. My, now might be the time to strike with an iron bright, iron uh, hot. Uh, thank you. Whatever it is. All right. So, <laughs> thanks so much for tuning in. Okay. Till next time, be good. Be green. Be green. <laughs>